Scott. Hello again. Uh, my name is uh, Larry Baker, and I'm in the Department of uh, Bioproducts and Biosystems Engineering. I work on water, water pollution, and water policy. And uh, this is lecture number four, uh, Approaches for Treating Water and Sewage. So in previous lectures, we've talked about hydrology, we've talked uh, uh, about water uh, pollutants and, and the global water and sewage uh, sanitation um, uh, system, the, the, the statistics in terms of accessibility and so forth. Now we're going to talk about uh, treating water and sewage. Uh, and look at, we're going to look at approaches both at the household level and at the, um, uh, at the urban level, the uh, sort of industrial uh, water uh, treatment. Uh, these are some uh, uh, the photos here. Uh, the lower one is uh, a discharge of wastewater that was very po poorly treated uh, back in 1974. This is in Houston. Uh, this water, uh, we talk about primary treatment, uh, just enough to settle out the solids and then decontaminate with chlorine. And at that time, you would inject rather huge concentrations of, of chlorine to kill everything and then discharge it with no other treatment. And I mention that because uh, this is sort of the situation in the United States in the 1960s and 70s, early 70s. Uh, we now would have much, much cleaner water um, from advanced treatment uh, systems. And I'll describe that a little bit uh, later. Um, this is a river that I had used in a previous slide too. This is just a uh, fairly polluted river in Burkina Faso. Uh, this is the kind of unimproved water that many, many people in the world uh, still have to drink. Uh, this is a, in the same city, a water tower. I had, had mentioned that they uh, do have community water supplies and, and uh, the, the, uh, there is a fairly modern water treatment plant in the city and, and a fairly good distribution system, although it's just to uh, community wells, not so much uh, to households, about 25% of the households or so. And this is a water plant, uh, just an aerial view. I'll talk about this in some detail uh, later. But uh, to put this in perspective, uh, this is uh, about uh, the length of a football field or thereabouts from, from the uh, uh, pre-sedimentation basins uh, onto the reservoir, the covered reservoir at the end, uh, perhaps the length of a football field or, or a bit more. Um, this is for a city of, of about uh, 100,000 people. Okay, now, um, I'm gonna start at the community level and work down to the household level. Uh, the surface water uh, is treated, uh, treated through a treatment train, that's what we call it, a train, like the, the, these basins are sort of connected. Um, and what we do, uh, and this is fairly universal, we uh, flocculate, you have fine particles coming in, you know, clay and, and dirt and stuff, and bacteria. Um, you, they tend to stay in the water. They tend to be uh, fairly fine particles. And what you do is you add some alum. It's uh, aluminum sulfate. If you happen to make uh, pickles, uh, that's the same stuff, really. And what that does, it forms kind of a gel. It binds with the particles. Uh, it looks a bit like dandruff when it's floating around in the water. But now it's heavier particles, and it sinks to the bottom. Um, that then goes through a long basin. I'll show you a, a picture in a minute uh, where the sediment is, is, most of the sediment is removed. It's then filtered through sand filtration and disinfected. Uh, if in the United States we use chlorine, other places use uh, ozone or such. This type of system is nearly universal. There's some modifications, but something like this, basically you filter, you get rid of particles, filter or sediment or both, and then you disinfect. Um, and the reason for removing the particles first is the bacteria are trapped on those particles and it's kind of hard to disinfect them when you have these, part, part, uh, these bacteria kind of embedded in the, in the particles and stuff. You've got to get rid of those first and then disinfect what's, uh, what's left. Uh, it, is, it can be very reliable, uh, even though it's fairly simple and the basic system is, is uh, about 100 years old. Um, and I had mentioned before, uh, in the U.S., where this kind of system is used virtually all over the place, uh, the number of uh, deaths from uh, drinking water disease are essentially zero. This kind of treatment plant does not remove soluble chemicals, uh, nitrate, arsenic, things like that. To do that, you either, t uh, typically, we look, to, if we discover that there are those sources, we typically try to avoid them. We go to a different well or a different watershed and pipe uh, cleaner water in. It is possible to get rid of, of both of these. Uh, arsenic is actually not 
terribly difficult to get rid of in this kind of plant, but you have to modify the process. Uh, nitrate, uh, you would essentially double the cost of, of treatment to get rid of nitrate. It is not easy. Uh, again, it's very, very mobile ion, as I mentioned earlier, um, and it doesn't uh, sediment, it doesn't attach to particles, and it's very difficult to, to get rid of. You need rever reverse osmosis or something uh, similar. Um, if one has a well, uh, we typically don't have a surface water treatment plant. You don't need it. Uh, a, lo a lot of times if you have uh, uncontaminated well water, and it often is uncontaminated because the water percolates down and gets cleaned up as it goes uh, um, vertically into the aquifers, uh, we very commonly won't uh, uh, filter or treat except uh, to disinfect, to inject some, again, in the United States, we inject some chlorine just to keep the bacteria, any bacteria that might enter into the pipes downstream out uh, of the water. Uh, now, of course, um, when you start contaminating wells is when you have to start switching to uh, surface waters uh, that maybe don't have the chemical pollution, but now you've got to get rid of the particles and the bacteria uh, that you can uh, assume are, are in there. So uh, protecting wells is always the best thing to do. It's probably always the cheapest thing uh, to do, unless it's very, very deep. This is uh, the water plant I had shown uh, earlier, and I'll describe a little bit what goes on in, in these plants. First of all, this isn't a desert city. This is in Tempe in, in Arizona. Uh, here's the uh, canal that, that brings the water in. Uh, in this case, they have a pre-sedimentation basin before they, they add the alum, just to settle out whatever crud is there uh, yeah, in here. Then they move, this is a building here. The water goes underneath through pipes. Uh, they store the chemicals here, they add alum uh, in a flash mixer, it kind of uh, stirs it around, and then it goes into these, uh, what's called a flocculation basin. Uh, this has a mixer, a slow mixer, it looks a little bit like an old-fashioned riverboat. The paddles are wood paddles, big long wood paddles, stirring, uh, they're on a, you know, mounted on kind of a circular type of thing, and they're kind of stirring very slowly uh, the alum around to get the particles, those, those uh, aluminum hydroxide particles formed and, and they're like, a little bit like jello. I said they look a little bit like dandruff. Uh, and then they, can, and they attach to these particles. Uh, and once they're attached, you go into the sedimentation base and, and they settle out along the way. Um, there's some powdered activated carbon that's been added here. Uh, that makes it hard to see that, but uh, the sedimentation. But as you were if you were to walk along here, along this sidewalk here, uh, you would see as you walked along the water get it going from turbid to really quite clear by the time it gets to the end. Nevertheless, you also run it through a sand filter. These are uh, about the size of a, a, also a decent sized room or so. Each one of these, there's uh, eight of them here. Um, and these have sand, uh, it's about three feet deep, a fine sand on top, then a coarser sand, and then uh, some. Um, uh, uh, even coarser uh, uh, and denser uh, particles uh, on the bottom. This is periodically uh, cleaned by, by moving water in the other direction and, and, and wasting it into this uh, pond over here. But when it's filtering, uh, it goes down to about three feet of media uh, and comes out really virtually no particles whatsoever. So it's a combination of this flocculation with alum, uh, the sedimentation along these long basins, and then a sand filter. Um, and then chlorination is done uh, in, in a under, underground here as the water moves from here to, to this reservoir. And there's usually some sort of water storage uh, that uh, can be a day to several days uh, long, uh, just in case the power shuts down or, or something like that. This is a pretty typical uh, design of a water treatment plant. There's nothing new about this, really. And I'll show you a couple of uh, statistics to show you where, where you can get to uh, uh, over time. Uh, this is for the United States. It's, it's deaths from typhoid. Uh, back here in this area, we really were doing some sand filtration. Chlorination really began uh, in, in 1908, was invented or, or discovered that chlorine would work for water treatment. Uh, there was additional, it wasn't just chlorine, there was actually more sand filtration. But somewhere into here, people gradually started adopting this combination of filtration and, and chlorination, and uh, typhoid de deaths have dropped to uh, virtually uh, zero. Um, 
the combination of clean water technologies, uh, improved uh, water treatment, impro improved sewage collection, uh, really had a huge impact on mortality in the United States. And again, I mention this because much of the global south is about where uh, the United States was in the first half of the 20th century or early 20th century uh, when uh, people did die of typhoid, they died of other diseases from waterborne diseases uh, here. But there was almost a total reduction in, in uh, typhoid. Uh, most of that was due to clean water technologies. But there are other diseases too uh, that are helped by clean water technologies. Even pneumonia, uh, you know, you can imagine if a child has pneumonia, uh, their uh, potential for recovery is improved if they get good water and then don't otherwise get sick from diarrheal diseases, even non-fatal diseases, um, but on top of, the, of uh, pneumonia or other diseases. Uh, so, Having clean water uh, actually reduced all uh, uh, mortality by about 40% in the United States. And uh, our lifespan went from 45 to about 65 years during that period. So this is kind of the uh, chronology uh, that we might expect in the Global South as water treatment is more, or water technologies are, are uh, uh, gradually adopted or expanded. Uh, you will see this go down very much in the same uh, manner here. Now, going back uh, a little bit to the Global South, um, uh, household water treatment is very feasible. Uh, it, it is not so much different in the processes from large-scale uh, water treatment. Uh, there is removal of particles. Again, remember the bacteria and, and pathogens embed on these, in these particles, and sometimes they are the particle. Uh, by filtration, sedimentation, or sand filtration, uh, and in disinfectant, disinfection uh, at the household level, that would mainly be by, by chlorination. Um, this still won't remove, uh, this is just a reminder, it, it will not remove soluble chemicals. It will not remove arsenic, it will not remove nitrate, it will not remove salt. But it will remove most of the bacteria and protozoan uh, pathogens. Here's a, a diagram from the uh, Centers for Disease Control. There's actually a very nice website that you might uh, check out, uh, uh, put out by the Centers for Disease Control, where they talk about household uh, sanitation um, with, with these kinds of uh, filters and such. So this is a diagram of a sand filter. Uh, here's where the water comes in. There's a diffuser plate would be just something with holes in it. Uh, the sand is underneath here. Again, some finer sand, some coarse sand, some gravel. Uh, these are, uh, you know, most cases these could be locally uh, acquired. Uh, then there's a tube at the bottom that comes up and brings the water out to a uh, faucet or, or such. So it's, it's a very, very simple design conceptually. You can imagine this might be modified in a hundred different ways for uh, various local settings. But it's called a slow sand filter. Uh, it doesn't produce a lot of water. You're not going to take a shower probably with something like this. But at least you could get uh, drinking water uh, out of it. You can also do the same thing with a cloth, um, simply by folding a cloth and um, uh, filtering it into a, a carboy, a water bottle. Uh, but if it's filtered, it also must still be in disinfected. And the CDC site has, uh, shows ways of disinfection that are very, very inexpensive. Um, the very simplest approach would, if you had a Clorox, is it's simply a certain number of drops per gallon. I think it's three or four drops per gallon. Don't, don't trust me on that. Go to the CDC. Uh, uh, site and they have uh, uh, rather precise uh, instructions. So it is uh, quite p uh, possible to uh, uh, make your own water, so to speak, uh, at least if it's not grossly contaminated. Um, yeah. So, um, the, the, this is some costs in different countries of uh, different parts of the world of uh, household connection, uh, standpipe, uh, borehole, a dug well, and rainwater. As you can see, uh, you know, the cheapest, uh, let, let's just take Africa as an example, the cheapest really is uh, boreholes or a dug well or a stand post. Um, rainwater harvesting is a little bit more expensive, um, a little bit more expensive. You have to have a a roof uh, that can collect the water and, and you got to drain that water into a, a pipe and then you've got to uh, collect that water and, and in many cases would need a rather large uh, water container uh, to do that. Um, 
And the house connection now, you know, is, is at least double the cost of uh, rainwater connection. So it's why we don't have uh, household connections. Uh, $100 is uh, a lot in, in many parts of the world, uh, you know, in the order of $100, $150 uh, per household. Uh, because of that, what you see, and I, I have to give you a roughly drawn graph here because this is copy, the original was copyright protected. Uh, but if you want to go to this article, uh, there's nice uh, dots representing all countries uh, or many countries in the world uh, along this graph. So I've just drawn, redrawn the axis and the line that would uh, generally follow uh, those, um, those um, country marks. Uh, but as you see, uh, as income increases, uh, even uh, maybe a, a good uh, point of reference is when you reach about $3,000 or so per capita on a... Um, this is on a purchasing power parity uh, basis, uh, sort of the equivalent of U.S. Uh, dollars um, in terms of purchasing. Uh, you reach 50%. So, you know, it's not real high up uh, where you have uh, piped water to the premises. Uh, I think you would say at $5,000, you know, most uh, people uh, have piped water uh, going to the house. And then once you get to about 10,000 or 15,000, it gets to be virtually uh, everyone. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, many parts of the world, 5,000 is a lot of money where we're actually down here in sometimes the 100, 200, 300, 400 dollar um, per capita annual income. So 5,000 is uh, a, a fortune. But as you get to, to, this would be uh, Costa Rica, for example. And Costa Rica, I think, as near as I can see, uh, most people have household uh, water connections. Okay, um, uh, treatment and disposal of sewage is a little bit more complicated. There's a number of goals here. One is hygiene. The first one is hygiene. Uh, you want to prevent the spread of disease. Uh, aesthetics, there, uh, there are smells. Uh, you really don't want much sewage right around your habitation. Uh, then as we move down, uh, nutrient recovery, uh, many parts of the world to various extent uh, recycle human waste to crops to, for nutrients. It's also a great source of organic matter, uh, builds up the soil and, and, and such. Uh, and for, uh, you do have to move it and moving it is not an easy uh, process necessarily, particularly if you're doing it by hand or, or ox cart or, or that sort of thing. Um, you also want to prevent the degradation of downstream uh, waters. Uh, raw sewage moving into uh, rivers, uh, a little bit like uh, uh, what I showed in the first uh, slide there. Um, there is the potential for contamination um, uh, of, disease, of waterborne diseases, especially if it's not chlorinated. Uh, even if it is chlorinated though, uh, that chlorine dissipates, it only lasts for a little while, and you get the degradation of this organic material downstream and it can completely remove the oxygen from the stream. The rate of uh, oxygen moving into the stream for the bacteria to grow on, um, now these aren't pathogenic bacteria, they're just regular you know, soil bacteria, they will degrade that sewage, uh, but the, the, the river typically won't re-aerate it, re itself fast enough, and so you can end up with actual dead zones in the river. And then further down the river, much further down, uh, as all the organic material is degraded, the oxygen concentration actually will go back up, typically, and then fish can live again. But you do create a dead zone, and that's very undesirable. Also, right below a sewage uh, discharge, if there's no treatment, it is just very, very disgusting. Um, we did not, in the United States, get to that point uh, until really well into the 1970s and 1980s. We did a good job on the, on the uh, water treatment side, but we were still in a very early stage. We had piped sewage, but we were just discharging either raw sewage or sewage that was just uh, chlorinated for disinfection and dumping it into the river. I remember this because uh, when I was a kid, I used to uh, swim and had a raft on the Ohio River um, about 40 miles south from the nearest major city, and, and uh, uh, trust me, the contamination was uh, visible. Um, yeah, I, I made it through. Um, for uh, wet sewage systems, and that, by that I mean uh, flushed sewage, uh, you can also recover that water for irrigation and industrial uh, uses. You can also create energy or generate energy from that sludge that you uh, settle out. Uh, you can actually generate quite a bit of electricity uh, from that. 
So goals one to three are typical of household disposal methods and sewage treatment might also include goals uh, four and five. So I'll show you kind of a progression now of, of uh, sewage treatment here. This is again the photo I showed before. Um, unfortunately, very, very common. Uh, we dispose of sewage just through pipes that go directly into a ditch or a river uh, or such. It's very, very common in poorer countries. Um, this particular city um, uh, actually doesn't have much uh, collected sewage. You either have a septic system or you do uh, this uh, downstream. Um, dry sanitation. Um, this is a, I actually lifted this picture off the web. Uh, it's, it's uncopyrighted, but uh, this is a, uh, a latrine, a little, little screening around it, but really not much um, uh, else. It's uh, very inexpensive. There's no water needed. There's low space requirement. Uh, and it's not necessarily a horrible uh, uh, thing in, if there's uh, uh, not a lot of people around, like, like in this picture. Uh, if you walk up the hill and, and, and such, that may not be so bad. But when you have very dense urban areas, this becomes uh, a problem. Uh, the disposal is unpleasant. Uh, it adds health risk. Uh, if the pits are unlined, and particularly if you have a lot of them, again, in a city, where you might have you know, house after house with dry latrines, uh, that, wa that water can infiltrate the urine and, and such and uh, cont badly contaminate uh, uh, groundwater. Urine separation uh, is uh, something that's being done a, a bit in India, uh, uh, quite a bit. And I'm not sure to the extent that it's, it's uh, used elsewhere, but uh, the urine is collected separately. And uh, one of the important things here is that a lot of the nutrients in, in uh, sewage, or in household sewage, are in the urine. About 90% of the fo uh, nitrogen and about 80% or something like that of the phosphorus is in the urine. So if you collect that uh, separately, uh, you have a fairly uh, nice uh, amount of the, of the nutrients that can be then recycled uh, for plant growth and things like that. Uh, it also, if you did that uh, uh, at, the, at the front end, you know, when you're uh, urinating, uh, you would reduce the liquid, in liquid going into latrines and pit toilets um, and, and reduce the potential for contamination uh, in, in groundwater. Uh, this advantage is cultural acceptance, and it, because it is water, it's heavy, uh, uh, transportation at any distance becomes a, a bit of a problem. Third uh, type is uh, septic systems. Uh, these are, uh, I pulled this um, from, from a, a website in, in the state of Maryland. It shows a nice big house up here, but this can be done anywhere uh, in the world where you have enough land. And basically, the water comes down, it goes into a, a uh, cistern kind of thing, uh, a tank uh, under, under the ground. Uh, it decomposes a bit, the liquid comes out the top. Eventually you have to pump out the solids. Uh, that can typically be a period of several years. The liquid goes out into a drain field. Uh, this might be three feet below the, the, the surface. And these pipes are perforated pipes, uh, typically a couple of inches in diameter with quite visible holes in them, and the water percolates downward. Uh, the idea is that the uh, water is treated as it goes down um, into the uh, aquifer. Uh, they work fine uh, if you have the right kinds of soil, medium density soils, uh, and you don't have too many of them. Uh, it does keep all the contamination below the ground. Uh, but it can also leach nitrate uh, pretty badly. And if you have higher densities, many people doing this, uh, it can really be a problem. For one thing, the, the, the leach field itself takes up considerable space, uh, even for a single home, and you couldn't have this in a, a very uh, dense uh, urban area. But it works fine on, on, in rural areas. And uh, we use this, my mother-in-law has one on her um, uh, cabin up in the woods in Minnesota, and people have them in Africa and all over the place around the world. Now, as we move into community, water, community uh, systems, uh, they are not always complicated. Uh, this, I'm going to show you one that's complicated, but uh, many, many uh, cities around the world, towns around the world, have these, these kinds of systems that I'm showing here. Uh, this is in Nogales in Arizona, uh, right along the Mexican border. It's basically a big lagoon. Uh, sometimes they're aerated. You can see these aerators kind of uh, churning up the water out here. Sometimes they're not. They're, they're bigger. Uh, they can be quite large. Uh, you, in the United States, we still use these uh, small towns uh, 
you know, a town of 5,000 people might have something like this. Uh, uh, typically, you wouldn't have it for a larger city. You wouldn't have it for a larger city most uh, in the United States. Um, some African cities would have this kind of, of, of system. They still do. Um, they do not treat water to a very high level, uh, but they do reduce the biological oxygen demand, the organic content, and it still has to be disinfected as it moves out. Uh, into a river as such. Uh, and very commonly, it's used, this water is not put into a river, it's used for irrigation. Um, and I'll, I'll talk about that in, in a little bit. I'll show you um, some a slide. Now, now we get into the more industrial type of thing. Um, here's a sewage system coming from a city. Uh, you screen out the coarse stuff. This is uh, uh, truly a gross material. Um, um, Diapers, sometimes dead animals, all kinds of, of stuff. Uh, it goes into uh, a primary sedimentation basin uh, just to settle out the coarsest uh, sludge. It then goes into some sort of aeration system. This is showing a tank. I'll show you a photo in a minute with some um, more of an open uh, type of thing. Uh, then goes again, uh, the back, there, this is a, like a yogurt culture. That's the way to think about it, I think. Uh, there are bacteria in here, uh, natural bacteria. They uh, basically are living off the dissolved organic material in, in the uh, sewage. Uh, they grow, they become actually, they, the, the solids content actually becomes higher in this tank than it was coming in. So if you just were to filter everything out and measure the solids, it would actually be higher here, much higher, like 10 times higher here than it was here because you're converting soluble uh, nutrients into a bacterial uh, biomass. Uh, it then goes into another settling tank to get rid of this bacteria. Uh, the bacteria, some of it is recycled to keep the system going, just like you take a spoonful of yogurt and put it into the new batch uh, to, get the, the, um, to provide the bacteria. Um, the material is then um, uh, either recycled or discharged uh, downstream. And they don't show it here, but the sewage, the, the sludge is then, I'm sorry, they do show it. The sludge is then processed um, and it can be used in many cases for uh, agricultural uh, purposes, for growing things, uh, if it is not contaminated. Uh, not contaminated uh, is very important. Uh, this means that it's, uh, industrial chemicals and stuff have to be kept out at this level because this kind of a sewage treatment plant, uh, which is, again is fairly ubiquitous uh, around uh, uh, in, in, in advanced countries, and even in, in um, Africa, there, there's a good bit of this, in Asia and, and such. Um, uh, they do not remove toxic chemicals. So if there's cadmium or lead or, or zinc or anything else, it has to be stopped at this level before it ever gets in there. Those kinds of chemicals will actually kill this system. Uh, and I've, I've heard of that happening. Uh, uh, accidental spills and that sort of thing. Well, these bacteria, they're living creatures, uh, they will be killed and it's a, a really awful mess uh, when that happens. It also makes the sludge unusable for um, agricultural uh, purposes. Uh, this is a picture of what this looks like. Here's this gray, smelly, we haven't figured out a way to transmit smells through the internet yet, but I, I'll just tell you this is smelly. Uh, you, you're, you're first um, um, uh, settling that stuff out. Uh, then you are. Uh, then if, if this were a primary treatment plant, you would then chlorinate and discharge. Uh, but in what we call a secondary process, you do this. This is a aeration basin. This corresponds to the tank shown here. Just a little bit different. They're usually in, in the United States aeration systems. Lots and lots of air pumped in here. This is a high energy system. Um, a bit problematic. Here's a, oh, oh I uh, meant to hit the cursor. Uh, this is a secondary sedimentation. At this point, you can't really see it here, but uh, this water is really quite clear. Uh, I use the same picture here, but the, if this were the, this picture really corresponds more to the primary treatment, uh, but the secondary treatment, uh, you disinfect and it comes out. That would actually be quite clear. Um, you could, if you put that in a glass of water, uh, you probably couldn't tell it from a glass of drinking water. And in fact, it probably meets, it could meet all the drinking water standards. Uh, we don't usually do that, we almost never do that, but it, it actually um, um, is, it can be that clean under the right conditions. 
Um, the capital costs are very important. This is a, 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 obviously a limiting factor. Uh, simple pit or latrine, these are in uh, uh, US dollars in 2000. Uh, you know, we're looking at a pit latrine, latrine you know, uh, under $100. Uh, better latrine, I think this probably means lined, uh, you know, maybe a little bit more, a poor touch, flush latrine. Yeah, now we're moving up to a septic tank and, you know, these costs go up. And when you move to a sewer, you know, these move up uh, uh, really a great deal. Uh, three, uh, three to six times more expensive uh, than a pit latrine. So. Um, again, cost, if you just look at that capital cost and think about per capita income, uh, you know, you really need to be in the several thousand dollar uh, per capita uh, income range before you even start thinking about uh, these kinds of systems, unfortunately. Or money has to come from other sources. Uh, this is the percentage of wastewater treated by effective tre uh, treatment plants. Um, in Africa, most pipe water is not treated before uh, discharge. Uh, in Asia, higher percent, and even in North America, it's only 90 percent. Uh, and Europe, th this actually surprised me, it's only 66 percent, uh, which means uh, uh, not treated uh, means that it is simply discharged as raw sewage or possibly just uh, uh, chlorinated before it's uh, discharged. I did mention recycling uh, wastewater. Uh, this is something that's very commonly done in the uh, southwest United States. It's actually, I know it's done in, in Burkina Faso and Ouagadougou, but I think it's done in, in many other places too. We don't have real good statistics on that, uh, barely in the, in the United States, much, much less anywhere else. But this can be a, a, a very important uh, source of water. Uh, again, the water has to be well treated, but uh, typically, probably the major is irrigation of, of non-food crops. So these would be crops that are used for animals, like, like corn, um, uh, like feed corn or uh, soybeans uh, or uh, cotton, where you don't have a food problem at all. Uh, it's uh, often a very good uh, source of cooling water for industrial purposes. You remember from my Maslow's triangle, hydrologic triangle, we need uh, water for industry. Well, that doesn't always have to be real clean water. Uh, it can be um, uh, cooling water. It can be used for cooling water, which does not have real high um, uh, quality requirements. And environmental enhancements. Um, uh, this is in a desert uh, area. This is near Phoenix. It's, it's uh, an area called Mesa. Uh, they have a, a nice sewage treatment plant, and they could have uh, recharge it to the aquifer, uh, basically put it into a basin and just let it soak in. But what they decide to do instead is to create a wildlife refuge. This is a photo uh, that was shared with me from a, a guy who runs this uh, refuge. Uh, actually, the person who designed and, and uh, built this was a former student of mine uh, many years ago. Uh, but this is turns out to be they have made a very nice wildlife refuge out of this. There's about eight ponds. Uh, people come from all over the world to go to this little wildlife refuge. Um, uh, the area has, has been dried out. It's, it's been dry naturally. It's been dried out more by humans. And there's very little standing water, even though there used to be wetlands along the, the Salt River nearby. And so they've cre recreated this sanctuary, uh, kind of an artificial sanctuary for wildlife, and it, it works out very, very well. And then the water is, is actually infiltrated, it does go into one of these kinds of infiltration ponds, but uh, not before um, uh, creating some environmental enhancement along the way. As I mentioned, uh, lagoon effluent is often used for, um, it's often used for um, um, irrigating crops. It does have to be disinfected before it's reused. Sometimes the addition of either the addition of salt through the municipal process, you know, the urination, the, the uh, detergents and everything else adds salt to uh, wastewater that can bring it up to a point where it has a, a problem for irrigation. Or if you have naturally salinity water um, or naturally high saline water in your source water and then you want to reuse it for irrigation, that could be a problem. Um, and it can't have excessive uh, hardness for uh, cooling water. It, there are times when you can't use it uh, for cooling water. And here's some costs for uh, sewage treatment. Um, again, I want to start with a communal uh, septic tank. Um, uh, you know, uh, um, 
uh, relative to, to I, I guess it's an individual septic tank, uh, and you go down, you know, activated sludge treatment, which I'm talking about, this, this sort of yogurt process, uh, $1.80 um, uh, or 1.8 uh, relative to an individual uh, uh, septic tank. Um, so it, 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 you know, it gets more expensive, these waste stabilization ponds and activated sludge. Uh, this is the lagoon here. Uh, so it does get high uh, compared to uh, uh, simpler uh, treatments. Um, the annual uh, uh, cost, the operation maintenance costs, again, on-site sanitation is very low. And as you go to secondary treatment, uh, this, this activated sludge uh, process, uh, it, it gets uh, much higher. And again, you know, you're looking toward uh, you know, higher costs and, and um, uh, yeah, which means you you need the 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 uh, wealth, uh, the generation of wealth to really support this. In summary, uh, the nearly universal approach for water treatment is filtration and disinfection uh, from household to city scales. Uh, recall from the earlier lecture, we are getting to 90% improved water, and we are moving up in terms of uh, uh, the, the uh, meeting the microbial standard that, that one. Uh, a cell per 100 mils that I mentioned in, the, in lecture three. Um, and we are reducing the number of uh, diarrheal diseases uh, that kill people, uh, kill children uh, around the world. Uh, this, uh, again, you know, di typhoid and such go away when you have uh, well-treated uh, uh, water. And unfortunately, disposal of human excretion and sewage is more expensive. And that's why it's been slower to develop than uh, the water treatment side. And th thank you very much.